This video is brought to you by Brilliant. If you watch this channel regularly, it's fair to assume that you understand the basis of the UK system of governance. Whilst we ordinary citizens don't get to vote on every piece of legislation, at most every five years we get the ability to choose our representatives, or members of parliament, who sit in the House of Commons. Their job is to represent their constituents, to ensure that their voice is heard, and to stand up for them in the House of Commons. This system means that, through MPs, everyone in the UK has their voice heard on everything from policies of national importance, such as defence, and on issues that will affect their local areas, such as the creation of nuclear power stations, etc. Well, this is the theory at least. This is because there's actually always one area in the UK where this isn't the case. Yes, they have a representative, but their representative does not and cannot take the whip of any particular party. They cannot vote in Parliament, and they cannot voice their opinions on the floor. In fact, they're bound to neutrality. What makes things worse is the fact that the main political parties agree not to stand any of their candidates against them. So who are they? Why does this weird quirk exist? And is there any way of fixing this? And if there is, will this happen? Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and be notified when we release new videos. So enough of the cloak and dagger intro, the person we're talking about here is the Speaker of the House of Commons, currently Sir Lindsay Hoyle. To understand why their constituents are shortchanged when it comes to representation, we need to first understand how the Speaker is elected. The Speaker is elected internally, by fellow MPs. Technically, there are elections at the start of every parliamentary session, but by convention, MPs will always vote for the incumbent if they've decided to run again. So the only real competitive election for the Speaker happens when the incumbent resigns. An important thing to note here is that in order to be elected Speaker, you have to be an MP first. Now, as the vast majority of MPs come from parties, the Speaker will usually have had a partisan label when they first entered Parliament. To avoid any accusations of bias, each of the two main parties takes it in turn for one of their MPs to become Speaker. Once someone becomes Speaker, they must give this partisan label up. Right now, Sir Lindsay Hoyle is the Speaker, before he gave up his partisan affiliations, he was a Labour MP. Before him was John Burko, who was a Tory MP. Before him was Michael Martin, who was a Labour MP. Now, there have been some exceptions to this rule, and it is actually a rather modern convention. But in general, that's what happens. So, if you live in the constituency of the Speaker, you will have elected them on the premise that they align with a specific political outlook, and on the assumption that they will represent these interests on your behalf in the House of Commons. But if they choose to stand for Speakership and end up getting it, they're expected to abandon their political principles in order to be neutral. What makes matters worse is that during general elections, there is a convention where the main parties will not stand a candidate against the incumbent speaker. This means that constituents not only have an MP that doesn't represent their views, but they also don't even get a proper opportunity to vote them out. Now, it's worth noting that parties haven't always obeyed this convention. In both of the 1974 general elections, Labour stood candidates against the previously Conservative speaker. It's also worth noting that smaller parties sometimes refuse to abide by this convention, with UKIP standing against the Speaker in the 2010, 2015 and 2017 elections. Additionally, the Green Party stood against the Speaker in 2015, 2017 and 2019. Now, it's clear that voters in the constituency of the Speaker generally aren't all that pleased about this situation. A good example of this is the fact that, in 2017, in the Speaker's constituency, there were 1,967 rejected votes. This was something that Burko actually commented on in his victory speech. I note, of course, as everybody will have done, the very large number of spoiled ballot papers. I am conscious of and sensitive to the strong feeling which exists amongst a great many people of all political persuasions that the system that operates in the Speaker's constituency is less than ideal and some people would characterise it much more strongly than that. I hope people will understand that it is not for the Speaker to change that system. 
it's my commitment to report to my colleagues, and in particular to the relevant committee of the House, to look at the system and to assess from available options whether they think a better arrangement could be put in place. It should be noted that nothing has changed in relation to the Speaker's constituency. But could they? Well, as Burko noted, this could absolutely be changed. A simple way of changing this would be to remove the status of an MP from the Speaker once they're elected. This would allow a by-election to take place in the constituency, in which all parties stand. Now, the main argument against this is that voters may begin to feel election fatigue. But if you consider that the UK has fewer opportunities for citizens to vote than many other countries, the US for example with its propositions and initiatives, it might be that voters would be willing to engage in another by-election. After all, it's only one constituency that would go through this each election. All it would take for this to go through is Parliament's approval. Currently, it's fair to say that Parliament isn't exactly in an ideal position. While Prime Minister Sunak does have a majority in the Commons, it's a fractured majority, a majority that toppled two of his predecessors. Usually, a government only makes constitutional changes if they have a strong position in Parliament. Consider the new Labour government. They entered with a huge 179-seat majority and swiftly made the Bank of England independent, introduced devolution to Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, and made the judiciary independent from the House of Lords. Sunak isn't in the same position though. Unlike New Labour, he probably isn't able to put his head above the parapet and make similar constitutional changes. In doing so, he would risk backbench Tory opposition and undermining his already weak position. The current government is still in survival mode, trying to ensure that they're not toppled by backbenchers who have now twice tasted blood. Perhaps if Sunak strengthens his position and is willing to make this change, it could happen. But perhaps it'll never be one of his main priorities. These are all clearly huge decisions, but one much smaller, easier decision you can make is improving your skills and career prospects with Brilliant.org. That's because while we all know that the promise of AI is that it'll make our lives easier, it's very possible it'll make our work lives more difficult, replacing some people and requiring different skills of others. Brilliant, however, is the best way of improving your STEM skills quickly and in a fun way, investing in your own human intelligence. That's because Brilliant has thousands of lessons, from foundational and advanced maths to AI, data science, neural networks, decision making and more, with new lessons added monthly. And by the way, these lessons are interactive and engaging, designed around principles of active learning, so there's no boring lectures here. That means that by investing a few minutes every day in lifelong learning, you can improve your skills and feel a real sense of accomplishment. You can try everything Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days by clicking on the link in the description. Plus the first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Thanks for your support and for watching TLDR.